Welcome to Relogia, where all disciplines connect via art, sci, tech, trilogues. Edition 1 Human Dimension Opening Unity creates strength. Dr. Tvetana Ivanova, Art and Science Research Foundation, Are, Founder and President, Sofia, Bulgaria. science and technology. We've here today brought people from across the world who are experts in this field. They will present to you new forms of education, new forms of culture, new forms of research, new forms of industry. This will be a training that is not just international but cross-disciplinary. Unity creates strength is the symbol of Bulgaria. This kind of movement of arts high tech started 60, in the 60s and, um, sorry, and it's um, experiencing its new renaissance today with the, all the knowledge that we brought together. I would like to welcome our special guest that we are honored to have they'll be presented by Relogia. Thank you for being here. Krasimir Vaučev, Minister of Education and Science of Bulgaria. Mr. Donchev, Ms. Janote, dear guests, dear students, we are here today to mark the start of two events. We've got two occasions. One of them is uh, the tripartite dialogue between art, science, technology, trialogues. The other one is 20 years since Bulgaria started participating in CERN, the International Organization of Nuclear Research. So we've got Ms. Genotti here, the Director General of CERN. This is one of the basic and large scope projects of today. This is a symbol of world science. Looking for the God particle, you know that this started in CERN. The global network started there, and the adron therapy for cancer started there. And this shows you the importance of science today, the drama of investment in education and research, because that investment is very difficult to assess beforehand, because uh, you've got short-term, long-term effects, tangible, intangible, expected, unexpected results. We know, though, that science, education, culture are important. They are everywhere, in human relations, in our lives. They make our lives more harmonious, better, it's very difficult to talk about the future because we know that we know something, but we don't know much. And that's what CERN tells us. We are aware of 5% of the universe. All the rest is still unexplored. Time is going fast, but it's going to go faster. There will be processes that are even larger scope and more dynamic. So, of course, all the systems are facing challenges. If somebody fell asleep 200 years ago, 
If they woke today, the they're going to have a very difficult time. All those machines, digitalization, cars on the streets. But if they go into a classroom, the change isn't that great because they have come a long way, but they haven't changed a lot. Of course, they will have to change because uh, the manner of teaching will change, the subject matter will change. System are beginning to develop. So fundamentally, we are expecting to have a new subject matter and manner of teaching in education. We can safely say that the next decade education will not give you a job. This changes the pyramid of education, of knowledge that you get there. The pyramid should have a wider basis so that you can go up to different vocations. You're not going to transfer from one path of professional development to another, all the rest. You should have a crisscrossing of paths so that today's students will join the labor market in the next years. They should have the opportunity to crisscross skills. The uh, indices of skills will be different. We spoke about digital skills 15 years ago, meaning just using a computer. Programming was something specialized. Now we are talking about uh, mass digital skills, understanding logarithms, algorithms. This is what our children will have to face the algorithm of man plus machine. This is not only mathematics. This is ethics, this is humanities, understanding of humanity, culture, if you want. So the question is, how do we study? And we understand that each topic should relate to other topics Interdisciplinary learning, ho holistic approach is what we need. Integrated classrooms. We started with innovative schools. We've got 45 integrated subject matter in our schools, but we still have to introduce the competence approach, meaning not only upgrade through soft skills, but to provoke interest in learning in today's generation of students because they can access a lot of information but their motivation to learn has been dropping so this should be the focus of education systems and we should do it through innovative methods of teaching broader practicality of the classroom. This is what competence approach means. This should be the dominant culture in the system. That's what we're trying to do. It's not going to be an easy change. It's not going to come fast. But it's inevitable. Today's generation have already understood that we know a lot, but we understand little. That's why it's the education system that is charged with helping us stay informed, stay understanding, stay human. So we need to link education to science and culture. We have to link science to humanitarian revolution, to biotechnical revolution, to information revolution. I'd like to congratulate the organizers of the venue 
for offering us this initiative. I'm sure that is going to be useful for everybody present. Thank you. Tomislav Donchev. Bulgaria. You should have found me an overall like that, a white one, so that I blend in, but it's too late now. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I uh, don't like officious introductions very much because usually they are boring they are a waste of time and i'll be succinct because if you talk a lot even if you're smart the probability of saying something stupid goes up krasi minister volchev made it easier for me because he mentioned most of the important things such as national priorities, global challenges, everything. So I will use the opportunity to touch upon different matters. If we had more time, I would start the conversation about the point we are at right now, the projection for the future, because historically, today can be viewed as the era of discovering the steam engine. The parallel is clear because we don't know what to do with this new steam engine. We haven't come to the idea to put it on a ship or something like that. It's the same today. We've got a number of technologies, but we still cannot fathom the implications of their usage. So digitalization, networking, networks, artificial intelligence, they are just starting. And all those social, economic, political effects of those phenomena are unclear. And you know that it's not only roses and sunshine. If you look back, all new Technologies have led to social conflicts, but this is a long conversation and it's not appropriate for the officious opening of the event. So let me tell you two things and I'm really thinking on those. First of all, I'm anxious because we seem to have our noses in the air. People tend to think that humanity knows everything. We know, we have discovered everything, and this is simply not true. We don't know the secrets of outer space. We don't know the processes deep inside matter. We don't even know who we are and where we come from. We don't know where we're going. We still haven't learned to manage our societies properly, but the feeling that we know everything is extremely dangerous. This is the beginning of intellectual sloth, and it's more dangerous than physical sloth. If we think that we know everything, there is nothing more to learn and discover. And the main thing is, how can we reawaken curiosity? The will to be a researcher, because in the past, young people dreamt of discovering new lands. Children dreamt of flying into space. So did I, and look at me now. So we should find the algorithm of daring, of curiosity. I don't know what educational technologies my colleague will recommend but the world is not an app on your smartphone. Okay, I use a smartphone too. But 
our horizons should not be restricted to the monitor of a computer. We should go deeper. We've got a very special meeting today and tomorrow, and I'm sure that it will help young people, and that makes me happy. Thank you. Buil Banov of Bulgaria. Good morning, I'm Amelia Gesheva, and I have the honor of greeting you on behalf of our Minister of Culture on this wonderful venue. The Minister is participating in the Council of Ministers in Brussels, discussing the potential of creative industries in Europe and their future. Now, after my colleagues spoke, I've got nothing left to say. I agree with them fully. And it's a good day, which starts with culture, with open senses, with curiosity about the future, how to give people your best. This usually is an individual approach, but this conference shows that using dialogue, using the interdisciplinary approach, we can find our common path for the future together. I'd like to thank the Ministry of Education for taking the risk to organize this venue and together with the NGOs, with the businesses, with the National Academy of Sciences to set up an event that can gather us here to think about the future. I'm sure that Relogia 2019 is not the last event dedicated to mixing education with art and culture and technology and research. And I'm sure that Bulgaria would add to the global discussion on this symbiosis and the paths to it. I believe that artificial intelligence has its future. So when I prepared my speech today, I thought about uh, the model of administration, of people and connecting to them because a better policy means adopting this symbiosis. So I thought about what Mr. Volchev said and there is another aspect. Now, whatever we do, however we plan, we still have to keep our values. We have to be moderate in our approach to AI. And we mustn't forget that what's basic are humans and their urge to know more. Those people should develop on their own, with their own imagination. And I'd like to end with a thought. Now, six centuries ago, people also had similar ideas on how to combine art and science. So, some of them took on this symbiosis. They combined everything to invent, to paint like da Vinci. They had the challenges. They didn't know they were geniuses, but they were. And I hope that we can help develop the new geniuses with their new potential, with their future. A creator who changed their time said that the most beautiful thing that we can live through is the mysterious. That's what Einstein said. This is the beginning of all real creation and science. Those who don't feel emotions, those who cannot stop and wonder, those are blind and dead men. Let's not be blind when we think about the future. I wish you success, and I'm sure that this is just the beginning of our big discussion. Thank you. Thank you.
Rector, National Academy of Art, Sofia, Bulgaria. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, in the sphere of today's visual arts, design, technologies and science have always been present there. The permanent development of new media, new fields to create, to have artistic ideas, can be followed through the late 20th and the early 21st century. So the technological trend is the only one that gives new directions if art after the end of the avant-garde. So it's a logical thing that art and science coexist in today's art education in Europe and Bulgaria. We understand the realities of today and that's why our academy joins the SIM platform that gives you the framework of this innovative interdisciplinary approach. And SIS setting up young people's artistic skills is a process. We prepare an open ongoing seminar dedicated to art and science, technologies and SIM methodology. And finally, as an artist, because I've been one all my life, innovation and science are part of all the creative trends in today's world. And I'm sure that an artist needs science and technologies because they are a means to an end, to an artistic end. And this is the major stimulus you need talent, you need inspiration. I wish you a successful session and I wish you inspiration. Thank you and uh, Godspeed. Dr. Fabiola Gianotti, Director General, CERN, European Organization for Nuclear Research, Switzerland. Thank you very much. I'm very, I'm very pleased to be here today and to have the opportunity to say a few words at this in the opening session of this nice conference uh, in the presence of the Deputy Prime Minister, thank you, the uh, Minister for Education and Science, and many other authorities. So today I'm going to say a few words about CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. So you may ask, what does CERN have to do with uh, art, science and technology? Well, at CERN we do science. Science is our main objective. We develop technologies to accomplish our goals and we have put in place a large number of initiatives related to the arts, exactly to show that science, humanities, arts, they are not different things, but they are all the results of, the, of human curiosity and creativity. If it works. Okay, yes. So let me first remind you that CERN is the largest laboratory in, in the world for particle physics. Our main mission is science uh, and is fundamental research. Uh, we study the elementary particles. An elementary particle is an object that cannot be cut into smaller pieces. So the elementary particles are the fundamental constituents of matter, the matter of which we are all made, and the, and the matter of the visible universe. And this re these researches have led over the decades to great discoveries. The last one is the Higgs particle, the Higgs boson in 2012, and to many Nobel Prize awarded to scientists working at CERN. So this is the scientific component. The second component is the technology and innovation component. In order to accomplish our physics goals that are extremely ambitious, we need to develop and to build very complex objects, 
particle accelerator, particle detectors, and big computing infrastructure. And we have to uh, develop new technologies in many fields, from big data to uh, uh, cryogenics, to vacuum, to electronics, to superconducting ma ma magnets, etc. And these technologies are transferred to society for free because we are a publicly funded organization. So the brightest example of this transfer of technology from CERN to society is the World Wide Web which was developed at CERN in 1989 by Sir Tim Berners-Lee and collaborators. At the time, Sir Tim was a CERN employee and then was released to society for royalty free and has changed the way society accesses information. But there are other examples, for instance, in the field of medical application that are very close to the heart of Bulgaria and I will come back to this later on. Another important pillar of our mission is training of tomorrow scientists, engineers, physicists, training of technicians, and also education of high school students and teachers through many initiatives. And last but not least, CERN is a concrete example of collaboration across borders because it attracts some 18,000 scientists from all over the world, more than 110 nationalities. So CERN was founded in 1954. This was in the aftermath of World War II with two goals. First one was to bring back scientific excellence in Europe after the war that has seen many bright minds, many scientists migrating to the US and to uh, Russia. And second, to foster collaboration among the, the European countries after the war through science. And today we have 23 member states, Bulgaria is one of them, and this year we celebrate the 20th anniversary of uh, Bulgaria joining CERN, we have associate member states and uh, others. The budget is about 1.2 billion Swiss francs a year and is shared among the member states in proportion to their income. So Germany is the, the largest contributor. Bulgaria contributes about 0.3% uh, of the budget, so 3.5 million Swiss francs a year. And this budget is used to uh, develop, to um, operate, to upgrade the scientific and technical infrastructure, accelerators, workshop, laboratories that are used by the worldwide uh, community of physicists who do their uh, research work at CERN. And here you can see a nice map of these um, scientists. We have in total 18,000 people. You see many of them come from member state countries in, in dark blue. But we have also many scientists coming from non-member state countries, big, uh, big uh, powerful countries in terms of science like the US, like Russia, like China, and like Japan. And we also have scientists coming from countries that are not really at the forefront of science and technology, like Oman, like Morocco, like uh, Madagascar, etc. And in this case, their involvement in certain activities is a way for them to build and develop and uh, close the gaps with the most uh, developed countries. Bulgaria contributes with about 100 uh, scientists with very, very high visibility, and I will come back to this later on. If you look at the age distribution of the 18,000 scientists, you see that most of them are really young people. You see a peak at 27 years, and about 50% of these scientists are below 40. So the workforce is really a young one. Now, only 10% of these scientists remain in research in particle physics. 90% go elsewhere, and uh, half of them go to industry. So our goal, together with the participating institutions and universities in the member states, including Bulgaria, is to prepare these people for a work in society. In particle physics, if they want to continue and they find a job, or otherwise in industry, from finance to computing to communication, engineering, or in other uh, public organizations. Okay, so let me say a few words about science, and then I will go to technology and the arts. At CERN, we study the uh, elementary particles, among which we find the building blocks, the elementary constituents of matters. You all know that matter is made of atoms. Atoms are made of a central nucleus, surrounded by a cloud of electrons. Uh, nucleons are made Nuclei are made of protons and neutrons, and protons and neutrons are made of more elementary particles that are called the quarks. And as 
as far as we know today, quarks and electrons are elementary particles, cannot be cut into smaller pieces, and they are the fundamental constituents of everything, of ourselves, this room, all this object, even uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, we are all made of electrons and quarks. Now, particle physics at modern accelerators allows us to study the fundamental laws of nature at the level of the quarks, so on physical scales of a billion of a billion of a meter, 10 to the minus 18 meters. And for this, we need big accelerators like those that we uh, uh, build at CERN. But at the same time, the study of the very, very small allows us to understand the very, very big, so the structure and evolution of the universe. And this is because we know today from cosmology and also from very precise experimental measurements that the universe had origin about 13.7 billion years ago from a big explosion called the Big Bang. At the beginning, the universe was very dense and very hot and was essentially a gas of elementary particles. So by studying the elementary particles at CERN in their interaction, we can understand how the, 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 uh, the universe behaved in the very first moment of its life. Then with time, it expanded, it was an explosion, so it expanded and it cooled down. And then the elementary particles got together to first, so the quarks first to form neutrons and protons, and then neutrons and protons to form nuclei, nuclei with electrons to find atoms, and so on and so forth, up to the uh, nice structure that we see today, planets, stars, galaxies, etc. And there are two complementary ways of studying the universe and its evolution. One is to use telescopes uh, on Earth or in space, and telescopes uh, allow us to understand the universe by looking at the big objects, so stars, galaxies, planets, etc. Sorry. And they look and they look at the uh, oldest uh, epochs of the universe by studying the farthest object. Uh, the, the objects that are, are farthest away from us. In this way, they can go back in time. However, they cannot go to earlier epochs than 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Because for earlier epochs, that is between the Big Bang and 380,000 years, the universe was a dense gas of particles and light was trapped. So this light never reached us, nor our telescopes, and so the universe in that period was opaque. It only became transparent to our instruments 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So the only way to go to earlier epochs is to use accelerator. And at CERN, we are running the most powerful accelerator ever, the Large Hadron Collider. So you see in this nice picture, the Geneva region. In the back, you can see the, uh, the Alps, Lake Geneva. And then, I'm so sure we and then you can see here this uh, dashed white line shows the border between Switzerland here and France in the bottom of the screen. And this yellow ring shows the location of the Large Hadron Collider. It's a 27 kilometer ring, 100 meter underground. So on the surface, you don't see much. You have to go down through some access shaft. Okay. And in uh, 2010, we, you see that most of it is in France, actually. And in 2010, we started operation. What does it mean? In 2010, we started to circulate two beams of protons, one in one direction of the ring, the other one in the other direction, accelerating these beams up to the highest energies allowed by technology, and I will come back to this in one slide, and then we bring them into collision at four points of the rings, where four big experiments called Atlas, ALICE, LHCB, and CMS have been installed in the underground cavern. And the goal of the experiment is to study the results, the product of this high energy collision. And so to measure all the particles, thousands of particles produced in the collision, to identify them, to measure their trajectory, to measure their energy, and therefore take a picture of the collision event. So these detectors, these experiments, that are giant experiments, can be assimilated to digital cameras that take pictures of the collisions. However, they have to be very fast because the two beams uh, collide 40 million times a second. So this already gives you an idea of the technology. And two years after start of operation, on the 4th of July 2012, the two big experiments, Atlas and CMS, and, and Bulgaria is very much involved in this, the leading country in CMS, announced the discovery of a new and very special particle called the Higgs boson. So, 
In order to produce these very high energy beams, we had to develop cutting edge technologies. Here you see an, a spectacular image of the underground tunnel. You see these blue tubes, which contain high-tech superconducting magnets. It was, it was a completely new development that was driven by CERN in partnership with industry, and then the 27 kilometer of magnets were built by, by in, uh, industry. These magnets are superconducting, so they work at very low temperature, minus 271 degrees, so also a lot of technology in, in the cryogenics, etc. Also, the experiments are quite impressive. This is a view of the Atlas experiment. You see the size compared to two human beings in the red circle. It's half the Notre Dame Cathedral. Uh, the other experiment, CMS, uh, has a weight that is twice the Tour Eiffel in Paris. So really a lot of technology and uh, precision and uh, uh, innovation. The, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2013, following the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, was given to uh, François Angler and Peter Higgs, two physicists that in the early 60s uh, predicted the existence of this particle. And in the motivation of the Swedish Academy of Science, the Atlas and the CMS experiment at the LHC are acknowledged. Let me say one word on technology. So you have seen that we develop cutting edge technologies in many fields. These technologies are transferred to society. I mentioned the, the World Wide Web, but I would like to mention another example that is very um, close to the heart of Bulgaria because Bulgaria is planning to host one of such facility here in, in Bulgaria. This is hadron therapy. Uh, it's a way of uh, 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 treating cancer complementary to the usual radiation therapy. When you have a cancer, usually what you do, you uh, irradiate it with X-rays. Now, the problem with X-rays is that they spread all over the places. So if you have to focus on your tumor, yes, you, 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 you bombard the tumor, but also you touch the tissues around. On the other hand, uh, mm, machines and facilities uh, using protons or light ions, like carbon ions, produce beams that are very focused. So if you want to bombard a given tumor, the beam goes just there and does not touch the other tissues. So these machines are very much used and are very much uh, useful, for instance, for kids, because you don't want to irradiate kids, okay, of course, or for tumors that are localized very close to very sensitive organs, like the retina tumor. Now, the technologies for these machines are developed, have been developed in the past, and now we are upgrading them at CERN. So this is an example of spin-off of CERN for society, in particular for health. And before concluding now, uh, I mentioned the science, I mentioned the technology, and now I'm going to mention arts. At CERN, we have several programs under the umbrella of Arts at CERN, where we try to show that arts, science, and technology are all the expression of human creativity, innovation, curiosity, um, and uh, initiatives. So we try to uh, inspire our scientists with artists and vice versa, to inspire our artists with the science that we do. And we have several programs that in particular um, involve resident, science, uh, resident artists who come to CERN for some time through different programs and develop their ideas inspired by the uh, surrounding uh, scientific and technological uh, environment. And I'm sure that in this exhibition also we'll see many nice examples of this cross-fertilization between arts, technologies and science. One word before concluding about Bulgaria and CERN. Bulgaria joined CERN 20 years ago. It has been since then a very strong partner and a growing partner with growing visibility across the world. They contribute to many experiments, in particular to the CMS experiment at the LHC. They also contribute in a very important way to the computing uh, uh, infrastructure. They are also very much involved in educational program, bringing to CERN uh, high school students, high school teachers, and partnership, partnering with us in many uh, technical schools, like for instance, the CERN Accelerator School and many others. So we are really happy of this very strong participation, very visible participation in, in all facets of CERN activities, from science to technology, to knowledge transfer, to education and peaceful collaboration. And we really hope that this collaboration can be expanded in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>